Tonight, I'm thrilled to have with us Alexandria Horowitz to discuss our dogs, ourselves, the story of a singular bond. Um, it follows her previous books, the best-selling best -selling Inside of a Dog, Being a Dog, and On Looking, as well as her writings in The New Yorker and The New York Times. I don't know how many of you saw her controversial op-ed piece in today's New York Times. Um, she has uh, a keen insight into the history and culture of dogdom and the profound connection between the human and canine species. Much of that knowledge is born of her work as a senior research fellow in the Dog Cognition Lab, lab at Barnard College, where she teaches creative nonfiction, canine cognition, and audio storytelling. Joining her tonight is Sigrid Nunes, author of eight books. We have five of them for sale, um, including uh, Siempre Susan, a memoir of Susan Sontag, and most recently, The Friend, and it was the winner of the 2018 National Book Award for Fiction. Excellent. Um, these um, join other honors and awards, including four push Pushcart Prizes and a Witting Award, and several others. So please welcome me in, um, please join me in welcoming Sigrid and Alexandria to this crowd of dog lovers and a dog. And there's even a dog here. Okay, so these are on? Yes. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, what we thought we'd do is, um, we thought that we'd start with um, my asking Alexandra some questions uh, and hearing what she has to say, and then opening it up to questions from the audience. So I wanted to start, I, kn I know that a lot of people uh, do know what Alexandra does uh, her work at the at the do, at the dog cognition lab at Barnard College, okay. But some people don't, so I thought we would start with um, uh, maybe you could tell us what you do there, uh, how you got started in that in the work that you do there, and also say something about um, how you interact with the dogs there, because I understand that there are certain constraints. You can't just be the right. way you want to be with the right. dogs that you work with right. there. So let's start with that. Right, sure, thank you. So the, the Dog Cognition Lab uh, grew out of my interest in understanding the behavior and cognition of dogs, what it's like to be a dog, essentially. That's my MO, I think. And I've always been interested in non-human animal mind. And I got into non-human dog mind somewhat accidentally. I was in graduate school and I was interested in how we find out what other animals know. And there are a lot of experimental methods to determine what other animals know, but I was interested in looking at naturally occurring behavior, because I was interested in what they know about each other's minds. In other words, do they think about each other's minds? Do they think about our minds if we're interacting with a, with a non-human? And so I was studying play behavior, because I thought that was a really likely place to find out about uh, animals thinking about other animals. Uh, so I was looking for an animal that plays a lot. And I was a graduate student, so I was very focused, but in some ways also dense. Um, and I was looking at chimpanzees who do play a lot, uh, but they don't always play on command, right, when you want them to play, uh, or they hide. Um, and meanwhile, I lived with a dog whose name was Pumpernickel, and we were taking her out to um, play three times a day in the parks around San Diego where I was in graduate school. And it finally occurred to me about six months later I should s study that, I should study dogs. And that's how I got to studying dogs. And then dogs became a more interesting topic than, than strictly the theoretical topic, you know, do they think about others' minds. So at Barnard, I began this dog cognition lab as just an orienting place to think about and research this topic. And I do it by doing natural observations of behaviors where we actually go out and watch these are owned dogs in natural settings, interacting with other dogs and with their owners. 
Um, and I also have this lab where dogs come in with their people and I present the dogs with some kind of test or some kind of comparison and I look at what they do in a, in a fairly controlled way. Um, and so what Sigrid is referring to is that when I come into, when people come into this setting, I need the people to come with their dogs because the dogs um, are not really the volunteers here. It's the people who are interested in volunteering and the dogs are the kind of agreeable subjects. Um, so they come in, but they can't, we can't be engaging too much with the dogs. We want them to look at two stimuli on the ground. One has four treats and one has one, but they're covered. We want to see if they can tell the difference by smell. Well, the way they solve a lot of problems like that is usually they ask us to solve the problem, right? When they have problems like the refrigerator door is closed, but there's a lot of food in the refrigerator, they ask us to open the refrigerator, most of our dogs do, instead of trying to get in on their own. So, and we are very responsive to them. So as soon as dogs start looking at us and interacting with us, we look at and interact with them. In other words, to a researcher, that's called cueing. So we would be giving, people would be giving cues to the dogs about how to solve the problem based on the owner's hunch about which is the right answer to the problem or based on the researcher's hunch about or feeling about which one we want the dog to choose. So we cannot interact with the dogs. The dogs come and we say hello to the person and we kind of look at the dog. We don't smile at the dog. We don't, we might wear sunglasses so the dog, we're not giving them any cues. We don't touch the dogs. It's very sad for my researchers <laughs> that we're not touching the dogs until the very end of the study, in which case we can all roll around on the floor together. Um, and bizarre, I think, for the dogs. So that's, that's our MO. It's like this unusual place where we try to be as naturalistic as possible, but we also um, are kind of jerks to the dogs. I can't believe you wear <laughs> sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, or we'll turn our backs so that they can't get any information from us. Yeah, we act really bizarre in a way, but I, it, it works. You can just imagine what cats would have to say <laughs> about all of this. Well, cats would not participate, <laughs> I think. <laughs> they would refuse participation. I was very, um, people who own dogs will, will all understand this, and this is something that comes up in the book. Alexandra talks about something she calls the guilty look. It's something that you studied. Yeah. The guilty yeah. look that dogs, what is that all about? And I'm reminded of the way it was put by someone I know. They said, the dogs always look like they're about to lose their job. <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, so, so talk a little bit about the guilty look and the study that you did about for it. Yeah, one of the things, when I started studying dogs, they hadn't been studied. They weren't a research animal, particularly at the time. And partly that's because they live with us, and we kind of think we know them, and we're familiar with them. And, so th and also they're not exotic animals. They're in our house. Um, so I did get interested in the fact that we make all these attributions to them. And I thought, well, I could use my science to test some of those attributions and see if we're accurate about our attributions. And one of the classic ones is this guilty look where a dog you know the look, right? They put their head down or they turn away and their tail is tucked or, and um, they do, one of the researchers called it a Tai Chi slink away from you and people say, oh, I know, you did something wrong and they go and find the thing that potentially the dog did that was wrong. So I thought, well, is that really what they know? I mean, it's a real look, but do they know that um, they've done something wrong and feel guilty about it? So we set up a very simple experiment to test it where we asked an owner to put food in front of their dog and ask them not to eat it and then leave the room. And when they left the room, well, the dog either ate or didn't eat the treat. And we assured that they wouldn't eat the treat because we, we took it away in half the cases. And then the, the owners came back in and we said, what had happened? We announced what had happened. The dog ate the treat or they didn't. In other words, they obeyed your command not to eat the treat or they did not obey. And if they had obeyed, we asked the owners to um, just greet them happily, you know, so sort of reward them. If they disobeyed, in other words, if they were guilty, we asked them to scold them as they usually do, and most owners were, you know, very gentle scolders, but, you know, it was like, no, Finnegan, 
what did you do, this kind of thing. But sometimes we switched it up on the owners. So half the time the dog um, ate the treat, but when the owner came back in, we said to them, oh, they didn't eat it. So the dog got a great happy greeting from the owner. And half the time the dog did eat the treat, and so they were guilty. Is that right? Am I, did I confuse it? They were guilty and we told them that they were not guilty. No, so when they're guilty, <laughs> see, it's confusing experimental design. Imagine what it was like for the dog. So when they were actually guilty, we told them that they were not. So they ate the treat and they got away with the greeting. When they weren't guilty, they hadn't eaten it, we told them that they had, and so they were scolded unfairly. And we looked at the amount of the guilty look in all of those cases. And we found it wasn't the dog's guilt that led them to be showing the look. It was us. It was us. It was our looking angry at them and starting to scold them was what caused that look. And I thought that's fascinating, right? Because we, we automatically say we know what's going on in the minds of our dogs. You have a dog for a week and you're already saying, you know, this dog is like this, they have these opinions, they held a grudge because I was out late, they like this, they, this is their preferences, they don't like small dogs, you know, whatever. We, we have this whole set of ideas about what they feel, but um, they're not always right. They're not always right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I just thought that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I mean, now a, lot of what you, a lot of what you explore in the book is how insanely contradictory our attitudes towards dogs is. Um, that on the one hand, we love them because they're not human. They're a dog and all their dogginess. It's an animal. I've got a, I've got a pet. I've got an animal friend. That's a very exciting thing. Uh, but, but then we want the dog to be civilized. You even use it. We expect the dog to be civilized. A good dog is a civilized dog. So, um, so then we, we, we want it to behave, we want it to have good manners, not be naughty, yes. um, be obedient, be like a good child, be like an endearing good child. Um, but that means uh, not behaving like a dog, not behaving like an animal, as a matter of fact. So, um, so anyway, I thought that was interesting, that, just that contradiction. So I wanted you to maybe to, to talk a little bit about that contradiction and other contradictions that we have. Because there's, it, the, it, in connection with that, there's all this affection that people have for dogs and, 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 and many good things they will do for their, for their dog. You know, I mean, uh, you, know, it, you know, like for example, it, when there's, a, when there's a, a catastrophe, a disaster like a hurricane, people will not want to leave their dogs behind and will risk their own lives to, 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 to save and take care of the dogs. On the other hand, when you talk about, when you have the chapter called The Trouble with, uh, with Breeds, um, and you, it, it, you know, it's really a very heartbreaking and grim read, that chapter. Um, it's not that it was all news to me, but when you really examine it um, f for, for no real good reason, uh, people, dog lovers, or people who think of themselves as, as dog lovers, are, are actually willing to torture their animals and to see animals suffer abominably just to have certain characteristics. So it, it really is, it's a, it, it really is, I, 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 I use the word, an ins insanely contradictory set of attitudes that we have towards dogs. So Yeah, yeah I think that's the heart of this book, that really. Is the heart it's of the when book, you yeah. look at the bond and the relationship between dogs and humans, um, we have two faces entirely and sometimes in the same, at the same time. And the wanting them to be animals but also treating them like humans is kind of at the heart of it and breeds is part of that. So one of the breeds that suffers a lot is the pug or other flat-faced or brachycephalic breeds where we've bred them over not s so many years, over a hundred years to have less of a snout and their eyes are more central and they're bulging. And apparently we find that really cute because they look a little bit more like us, right? With our smaller nose and eyes in the front of our face. Like a baby. Yeah, like it's a, a little neotenous, right? They have the big forehead, they have big eyes. But the problem is their eyes are ulcerate. Their, their nose is so short that they actually don't have a pathway to breathe. And on most pugs you need to do a surgery 
just to allow them to breathe beyond sort of sucking through a straw. And we, we still sort of find it cute. So there's this weird tension. And I think that appears throughout the book. You know, we, we, we name one dog. We spend a lot of time. One of the things I love talking about was, was how we name dogs. And we name them often very human names these days. And we endow them with kind of familial characteristics. Yet at the same time, we're doing that as a society. We're euthanizing millions of dogs that are anonymous every year. So we exist with that all the time, right? Um, we celebrate that they're individual dogs that have their individual personalities. And as I say, we can immediately say what your dog is like. If any of you, if all of you have dogs and you, I, we talk for two minutes, you'll tell me what your dog is like, right? They are an individual. And yet in buying breeds, we're, or in making breeds, we're breeding them for sameness, to be the same kind, to be predictable in their behavior. If you get a golden retriever, you're going to get a dog who's like this, this, and this, right? Not individual. So our breeding and our owning practices are different. And it really goes on and on like that, I think, throughout the book. The fact that um, they're part of our family, but legally they're considered objects, uh, property, chattel property. So their value is what you paid for them, whether they're a shelter dog or a dog that you overpaid for because they're a doodle mix. You know, they're, that's their value. When they sit on the couch with you, they're an object in the eyes of the law, but they're your family at the same time. So those two things coexist in, in all of our lives. Yeah, and the, um, you know, you talk about how um, the, the breeding, the inbreeding, which is really what it is, um, the dogs have are bred for, for, for best, best, so-called best form. Um, exact, so you say that, so in addition to all these, talking about all these genetic disasters that have come about from this inbreeding, you talk about how we have, how we have changed it over the years from an animal to a showpiece. And why, you know, it, you know why, was that the, why was that the route that we took? Um, but that brings up the question, which is a great mystery to me. I mean, probably everybody, you know, many people know this story, right? Barbara Streisand had her dog cloned for $20,000. Okay, so the, this was it $20,000. Oh, okay, so, so this is the thing. You can have your dog cloned, but this is the great mystery to me. You clone the dog, it's not the, it's not the same dog. Right. It looks like the dog, but it isn't the dog, all right? So it makes absolutely no, no sense because breeding is already cloning. So why would you have to clone your, 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 your King Charles Span Spaniel? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you could just get another one from a, from a breeder and you would have the same thing that you would have. <laughs> so why would you pay $20,000 to have a dog that isn't actually... It's, so it, I, I it's really don't understand. Unusual. Yeah. yeah. Because you can't, it's not an exact replica. When, I thought it was. I thought you they did They might get, look very similar. And, and I tell you what, so, they'll they produce... They look like anyway. They'll produce enough puppies until they find one that looks most identical. Really? So it's actually kind of a farming practice where you need a, you need a uterus, for instance. So you have, a, I guess, a volunteer dog who's... No, she's not volunteer. <laughs> she's not and volunteer. she's not being paid. But her <laughs> uterus is being used to create these new um, puppies. And then you have all the other puppies that are the kind right. of non-perfect clones. And what happens to those puppies? But that's that's a, a little mysterious right, as well. But that's a physical thing. Uh, but the dog that even if you then get it to look exactly like your fluffy wuffy, it won't be the same personality. And isn't that really what you wanted when you lost the dog? You grieved that loss because the, 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 person, the person is gone. The, the, you know, the being is gone, not, not because of exactly where, what kind of beard and ears it had. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's bizarre because it's clearly the history that we have with the dog that we know makes up our relationship with them. It's the stories we tell as soon as we start engaging in the project of going through life together that make up what we think of as that dog. And that, of course, cannot be reduplicated. Right. Um, OK, we are both fans of um, uh, J.R. Ackerley's wonderful book called My Dog Tulip, uh, which is about his, um, his, uh, his, his passion and friendship uh, with his German shepherd, Qu whose real name was Queenie. I love that his real name uh, was Queenie. Her, her real name was Queenie, and she's called Tulip in the book. Um, and um, 
it's also a, a fantastic animated film that oh, I could so great. not yeah. recommend more highly. It's just so good. Okay, it was made in, it came in around 2010. I saw it at the Film Forum, Forum. it's just wonderful. And it's called My Dog Tulip. Isabella Rossellini is the voice of the, of the vet and Christopher Plummer is um, J.R. Ackerley's voice. It's, it's fabulous. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so Ackerley is somebody who writes about, uh, okay, Ackerley is somebody who really wanted his German Shepherd to have her full doggy life. You know, he was not going to have her spayed because he wanted her to, well, he, he, he wanted as much as he could. I mean, he, she, she had to go out, he had to use a leash when she went out. But everything he did, even though it was ter it could be terribly inconvenient to him and to other people, um, he did everything to try to create a situation where she could be as dog-like as possible. Like, so she had to, you know, it was in her to chase and kill squirrels, so he was going to take her where she could do that. He was not going to have her spayed. He said, how can I tamper with such a beautiful creature? I can't do that. But he wanted her to experience, he wanted her to experience sex, and he wanted her to experience motherhood, because that was all part of being a dog, and his love for her told him she must have this. So, um, so I wanted to talk, to talk about that, too, because other people, too, want their dog to have their full doggy life, but it is so, in such conflict with the needs of the owner so that's something else that I wanted you to talk about. Yeah, right, and that's a great example. Also, you know, Ackerley found that Queenie didn't want to have sex with all yeah. the dogs that he was proposing for Queenie. So, and she didn't have a, a, a litter of puppies. Well, she did, but not... Uh, right away, right. right. It was Right, and not with anybody that he set her up with. Right, so, <laughs> but it's a little bit, he's still anthropomorphic. He's still oh, imagining, yes. oh, yeah. right? What He's projecting onto her what he thinks is appropriate and normal and natural. So what counts as natural for a domestic dog is very puzzling because we are part of their natural life now. We can't just let dogs go. You just leave dogs and there's no humans taking care of them in any way or human society supporting them. And that's, they're not going to survive. They're dependent on us. Even the free-ranging dogs, they have very short, brutish lives. They also depend on the fact that they're on inhuman societies. So he's imagining that that's her natural state and maybe he was wrong. Um, but what I did celebrate about hit that was his willingness to embrace the messy parts of living with a dog, which we seem to be systematically removing from our relationship with dogs, right? And spaying and neutering is one of those things. I'm not advocating that we all stop spaying and neutering, but I think it's interesting that we do that because it allows us not to think about the dogs sexually, right? No breed standard for a dog says like, this is a sexy beast, right? They all, none of them say anything about sex. And breeders deal with sex, it's like this off, you know, we, we send it out. We send it out. If you want another golden retriever, you, you, you send it out. You don't have to deal with the fact that they have a, they're biological specimens. Um, and I find that, uh, I, I enjoyed that he at least embraced that. And it's not always convenient or easy. No, it was incredibly inconvenient, It's in incredibly fact. inconvenient. And yeah. we really want dogs to be convenient. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that's the dog that fits in your purse that's a convenient yeah. dog because you can pick them up and put them away. But what kind of life is that for a dog, frankly? To be bred to be that tiny, by the way, is disastrous for the dog biologically. But also, you're kind of not experiencing the world. You're, you're, you're an accessory. And the more we accessorize dogs, make them into accessories, the more suspicious I become of, of the motives we have uh, of, for owning dogs or living with dogs. Now, Ackerley also something that he, he, he said in that book that I found very moving. It was something that really worried him. Um, you know, we have made dogs. We, we have made them into a certain kind of being. And he felt that we had made them so dependent, for one thing, and so... Um, so, so emotionally involved with people and needing to please them, wanting to please them all the time, that their lives must be 
chronically anxious and stressed. And so, sometimes when you observe dogs, I, that does strike you, that the, 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 the desire, the, the dog wanting to make you happy is, is almost overwhelming. It's like, it's, uh, it, it, you, could see, you see that anxiety, I think, unless that's anthropomorphizing. I don't, I don't know. I think it's Accurate. real. And, you know, here's another contradiction. I, I love being around dogs. I don't want to not have dogs around. And at the same time, the more I investigate and just look, I, more I just look plainly at our relationship with dogs, the more bizarre it seems that we have domesticated them and made them this subservient animal to us, sort of designed to our whims. So I'm not saying let's stop doing that. I really want to be with dogs and around dogs. But yes, I think part of that is they are often anxious. They, we, that's a chronic problem that dogs have a separation anxiety, anxiety to we have a dog who um, um, we brought into New York City after adopting him at age three and a half um, in rural Pennsylvania and realized as we came to New York, like he, he didn't really like loud noises. And so that's not a thing you can kind of overcome easily in New York City, right? So he has this constant high level of anxiety that we have to try to manage and deal with. And, you know, they're waiting for us to make the next move through their whole life before they act. So, for me, the best thing we can do is let them start to make choices on their own, let them be a little bit independent agents, give them something to do that is their choice. I think that's, you know, within us as a society. Um, so when, I, when, I, when, I, when I published The Friend, I, I heard from a lot of people, dog owners, who, who talked about the, the guilt and shame they felt in relation to their dogs. In other words, they were, th what made them uncomfortable, what they, what they, what they might, might have hid from other people, was how much love they felt for their dog. They, 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 thought, they, they, they thought that perhaps it was just, in a, wasn't it wrong to have those strong feelings for a dog? Shouldn't that just be for other people? Um, uh, that just reminds you, I don't know who said this, but it was just a wonderful, a wonderful quote. Life, eight dogs and then you die. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's because, you know, and the idea is that um, the dog is the most important thing in your life. And the fear that, um, that, that loving them is somehow wrong to love them as children and maybe you shouldn't let people know that. But then, when they lose the dog, then it's much worse because then the grief they feel is so extreme then they feel shame and guilt about that um, and they can't really share it with people because they're ashamed of it. Um, and, you know, so people will apologize for it. Uh, so I don't know, so I, I, my response to this is love is never wrong. Um, but I was wondering how you felt about that. Yeah, about, sure. You know, is it, is it, you know, is there something, does it tip over into something morbid or something that, that, that shouldn't be to have, you know, to have that kind of feelings for a dog? I think there are, are there are bad relationships, you know, with animals like with people, but the, I don't think that love for a dog, like a family member, like an intimate, is ever overweening. And I think that's becoming more accepted. I do get people who still will apologize to me or try to excuse their feelings of grief about the loss of an animal, but I very much like step right into that and say, this is, this is, yes, you're feeling grief, this is normal grief, this makes perfect sense to me. And it really does make perfect sense um, as someone who's lived with a lot of animals that you have a great affiliation with an animal who you talk to all your days, who never talks back, who's always happy to see you, who accompanies you quietly through life, through your own passage through your life, that they then disappear without, if there were no commemoration of it, it seems to me that would be more bizarre than if you want to over commemorate it. And you know, yeah, I really yeah. wrote Inside of a Dog, partly you know, to this dog I had lived with for 17 years, uh, Pumpernickel, after she died, I woke up every morning for a year and wrote a memory of her, which many 
of which wind up in the book as just little moments with her. And that was my way of working through the grief. Was I over grief in a year? I don't know, right? Are you ever over a death? But yeah, I stepped right into that grief. I think that's normal and is a little bit unsolved in terms of how you deal with it because um, there are still people who think it's inappropriate um, or will mock you or even viewing your dog as as a child. I think very yeah. recently that was seen as a kind of pathology. Yeah. But 95% yeah. of people, I guess, in America think of dogs as part of their family at this point. So that's changed and how. Yeah, I think one of the other things that I didn't mention where the guilt comes in is, um, you know, s spending large amounts of money, uh, you know, on the dog, the idea being in a, in a world full of human suffering, there's something wrong with that. that I, th right. I think that's a, that's a hard thing for a lot of people. And keeping it alive, um, you know, with, with extreme medical care when very, your very neighbors maybe or somebody that you see when you step outside your house, I think that's a hard, I think that's a hard thing for people to, d to deal with. I think it's natural to feel a, a certain guilt and confusion about that. Um, you, you know, I mean, it, it, it just, it, I, think it's, I, I think it's a hard question. But I do understand why people, why people feel that way, just as I understand why, why pe some people have the very extreme attitude towards um, the idea of dog ownership, that, that it shouldn't even happen, that, there, that everything is wrong with it from the beginning. You shouldn't be owning another species. You shouldn't be owning a dog. And you certainly shouldn't have created a creature to adore you to die for you, because a dog will die for you if it has to, some dogs, dogs that are tra trained to do that, bred to do that, um, that there is an element of, of enslavement in that, and that, you know, and that, that it's a, it is a sign of what is wrong with human beings, that they would want to create this, 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 this devoted creature. Really, it's a path maybe we don't want to really go all the way down right now. I'm getting, I'm getting to bug me. Um, okay, something lighter and then let's open it up to, to other people. That's a, it's hard. It's hard. Um, okay. Um, and then, okay. Why this particular dog on the cover? You, you had to choose a dog. The cover show. Yeah. Okay. Why this particular dog on the cover? Well, you chose the cover. I'm, no, I mean, oh. in a way I did choose the cover, but um, as everyone in publishing knows and many of my um, the folks who I work with are here. I don't really choose the cover. You know, there's an art department to choose the cover, and um, I don't think dog. I'm maligning my publisher at all to say it's very important that there's a dog on the cover of my books. Absolutely. Um, and that's fine with me, but I'm very particular about my dogs. Sure. That's going to be on the cover. All the dogs are, and about to your me, covers. they're individual dogs, right? I'm not just, that's a cute dog. It is a cute dog. It's an earnest looking dog. It looks very sweet. There's some important things about it. There is, there is, a, there is a human in the picture, and so it's human and dog, and that's the dyad we're going for. That's the bond we're talking about. Um, but, and it, it's like some kind of mixed breed, probably Weimaraner mix. But, what was most interesting to me is that's an individual dog that somebody has named something, and as soon as I see that dog, I start thinking about who that dog is, right? So it's, I'm a difficult author, I believe, this way, where it can't just be like a cute dog on the cover. No, I really am against that. And, and there have been a lot of proposed cute dogs to be on the cover for my very first book. I will never forget some of the proposals for the dog. You know, a dog just leaping in the air, just things that had nothing to do. And who was that dog? What was, I mean, it, it was it, just the way you, if you put a human face on the cover, we would all start to make attributions about that person. You know, we know somebody who looks like that or why they have that expression. It would be, it would be, it's hard to put a person's face on the cover unless it's the person who wrote the book, right? Or a person who's featured in the book. You can't just put a random person's face on because it's too particular, and that's what I feel about this. So it's always a compromise between my ridiculous standards and the publisher's need to put something on the cover at all, <laughs> right? And that's where we got with this one. And I like, I like this one a oh, lot. Oh, very much. Yeah. Very, very much. And my, my last... Um, not, it's, a, it's not really a, well, I guess it, it will become a question. I, we've all heard this thing about how people look like their dogs, okay? You hear it all the time. 
It's completely not true. <laughs> Go out there and, oh, it's a it's it. Yeah, it's not true. It's not true. I mean, just let him <laughs> You know, if you, <laughs> well, there is like, research. Wait, no, well, let me just okay. say, okay, that, that's what I was going to ask because I know you put that research in your book, but I'm just saying because it's something that actually kind of annoys me how people just roll that out all the time. People look like they don't. You see, you see it all the time. But if you, because if you live in a place like New York where there are so many people and so many dogs, all you have to do is go out there and walk around. It's not true, <laughs> and it's and it's 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 a, it's a canard. And um, okay, maybe. Every once in a while, there might be, they always give the same examples. The, the bulldog face and a certain kind of man's face, and the, the, the poodle and the woman who's got a certain kind of hair. It's always, you know, it's always these same examples that they give. Um, but if you go out there, maybe that will happen. But in general, if you think about what a dog looks like, think how hard it is to actually find anyone who looks like that. It's just so, but there happens to be research. <laughs> well, research. So first, I'll say a couple of things first. I mean, the reason I wanted to talk with you, Sigrid, and it was so nice of you to accept the invitation to come and talk about this book is when I was reading The Friend, you really come up with all the topics that I wanted to think, think about and discuss in my book in, in your character's exposition and thinking about the relationship with this unwanted and surprised dog that she has. And, um, and now I feel with your annoyance <laughs> at people talking about dogs look just like their owners that you've really, really entered my world. <laughs> because that's what it's like. People always, people like to make statements, uh, general statements about dogs and that's just one of them. We could really spend a lot of time. That one, I, I'm happy to say I have researcher colleagues who decided to test this by asking people to match pictures of owners, guardians, with pictures of dogs, and they do it at rates higher than you know chance, so it's significant, but they don't do it every time. And they don't look like them in the way that you're looking in the mirror. They look <laughs> like <no> them <laughs> and there's no confusion, right? Like, is that the dog <laughs> picture or is that the person picture? I just can't tell. They look so alike. It's more like they have the same way about them. And when people tried to describe them, these are psychological subjects and they weren't great at describing what it is. They said, I don't know, like you just, that dog looks kind of happy and that guy looks kind of happy. I don't know. They couldn't really articulate what it was, but they still more or less chose the matching pairs. And I could come up with maybe post hoc reasons why that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely saw, you see people who are, you know, very fit with very fit dogs and people who, uh, you know, have, are, are not as fit with not as fit dogs, right? So you think there's something lifestyle wise that makes them match <laughs> each other. I feel like I, We'll always have mixed breed dogs that are kind of of indeterminate origin and not too well groomed, you know, but like sort of nice, like a little glossy, <laughs> but not all the way through. Like I feel like there's something about the style of my dogs which often winds up matching me. And that might be the reason I choose that dog, right? Since we're the ones choosing the dogs. So we, you know, we like to see ourselves in our dogs. We want to I be think, reflected yeah. in them. So if you view yourself as, um, you know, enjoying, in, in, enjoying um, going unwashed for m weeks. You're not going to choose a poodle which needs grooming mm -hmm. every week and which winds up with a little poofy tail and a bow in her hair, right? So the person who does that is someone who really likes putting bows in things, right? And <laughs> might put bows on themselves. So there are, might be reasons that it happens to that degree. Okay. All right. So... Um, yeah. Can we, yes, should we have people ask questions? I think I learned this in sociology, that dogs chose humans originally. And, you know, that dogs would approach a village and kind of look like they wanted a home or... Yeah, I mean, that's a way of talking about it, that wolves, well, so we don't exactly know what the origin story is for domestication. Um, the 
she said, dogs chose humans, I learned in sociology. Um, but a very likely story that does, is consistent with other evidence that we have is that some proto-wolf, or proto-dog, a wolf, um, was maybe more likely than other wolf, other wolves to approach the outskirts of an early settlement of humans. And at the outskirts of those early set settlements were often our trash. Just like now, we throw our trash just right outside. Um, and that would have included a lot of food matter which is inedible to us but would be edible to the wolves. And some wolves might have had a tendency to view this as a new food niche and scavenge as opposed to, you know, here's available food that's recently dead, you know, I might as well eat that. And then maybe some of them started to make their way into the settlements and then were selected, right? Some might have been eaten, some might have been kept for a while until they had puppies. And so you do get this kind of mutual domesticating happening. But, um, and certainly I don't think those early humans were thinking Let's take that animal, but there were a lot of circumstances that contrived to make them a good match. Um, and I think the reason we say we chose them is because over time, we are, we are explicitly breeding them, right? We took over their breeding process and selected who got to live and die, who got to have puppies and not. But yeah, early on, the wolves had a part in it. They're partly responsible. D uh, do, you, do you ever think about cats? Um, well, Sigrid probably does because yeah, I'm a cat she person. is a cat person. I'm yeah, cat I, ha person. I live with a cat. Um, I I feel like it's one of the things about being a dog researcher that people say like, oh, you must hate cats, right? Like it's as though dogs and cats are kind of always at war. Um, and I love cats. I they just don't do the dog things mostly. Um, they are also, for cognition purposes, harder to study because the dog willingly comes into the lab for the most part and you can show them something and they do something. So just do that with your cat. You know, sometimes you could, first of all, bring them into the lab, see how they feel about that. That's probably going to be uh, alarming. And, and then show them something and see if they'll act on it in some way. There are two things. You would choose one of those things, you know. Maybe tomorrow, right? <laughs> You're the waiting forever. So they're not a good research subject in that way. You know, people have um, talked about writers and cats and dogs, and you know, writers are, are, are drawn to cats, or, or so it's said, or a lot of writers are. And um, writers will say, um, oh, you know, the cat jumps. I want to get up from my desk, but the cat jumps in my lap, and then I don't want to move, so that keeps me at my desk. And, I, and, the, and the idea of the, of the dog or the cat reading your work, um, the idea is that if the dog would read your draft and the dog would tell you, oh yeah, it's the best, it's the best, it's the best, 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 it's the best, it's the best novel anybody ever wrote, just the best. And the, the cat, the cat would, would never give you that. The cat would just never give you that. <laughs> Now the question. Good evening, Ms. Horowitz. Uh, thank you for being here. I'll stand because I know I'm short. Um, I'm curious to know if you address in this book or maybe one of your others, uh, I guess, proven information about food matter that is or is not good for dogs. Because I hear so of dogs, many rumen, really. right. rumors, yeah. and I've seen my friends give their pets all kinds of stuff right. that I wouldn't even eat. Right. So I'm just curious to know <laughs> if you address that and not, what you say about not, that. Well, Thank so you. I don't study nutrition and I haven't done a, a large amount of research into nutrition science, of which there is a science. And what I do get into in this book somewhat is the history of how we've come to um, feed the dogs the things we do now which is just a history of marketing at some level, right? So maybe uh, 150 years ago, somebody had the idea when breeding started going, um, going on gangbusters and there were suddenly a lot more dogs and dogs were in people's homes and uh, somebody had the idea they should be, there should be a food for those dogs, right? And took hard tack, these biscuits that were given to sailors on ships because they're last forever, um, just a wheat biscuit basically and just started selling it as a dog food. Uh, over time, that became a kibbled food because you just break it up into pieces. And, this, and hence, what, 150 years later, we're all feeding our dogs kibble, right? It comes from that. Now, 
dog food companies have nutrition scientists, so, but there's no federal regulation of something like that. So they need, they make some estimation and they keep dogs to test about what nutrition, um, what, how much protein they need, what kind of uh, carbohydrates they need, what things are, are bad for their development, which things are good. So, so kibble and dog foods are attempting to do that nutrition science for you. There are good reasons, though, to reject you know, their attempt to sell you food that might be the leftover meats that we wouldn't eat of an animal. Um, and so there have been a lot of other people who say, oh, well, dogs were wolves, right? So we should just give them raw food because that's what dog, wolves eat, right? They don't cook their food or put it in kibbles. And I understand the urge behind that, but there's no good nutrition science behind that. Um, in fact, we know that dogs uh, have a gene that allows them to digest carbohydrates, where wolves do not, something that would have changed in our history with dogs. So they, you know, my bagel-loving dog can eat the bagel, um, or the many bagels, as the case may be. So I don't go into it fully, and it's actually not really well discussed in most of the literature except for by a research sponsored by the pet food companies. You know, there's not a lot of money in dog science unless you're somebody who's going to be creating a product or in some cases and now more recently um, unless you're talking about a therapeutic interaction. So working, do dogs who are working with uh, children with autism, you know, help their abilities to develop for instance. There's NIH funding for that. So if there's not funding for it, there's often not the research done for it. So we're kind of beholden to the pet food science. Um, just one other thing that I learned somewhere along the way that probably isn't right either, which is that if, if you leave dogs on their own and they breed on their own, they'll eventually start looking like dogs used to look as opposed to um, mm -hmm. these cute little dogs running well, around. It's certainly the case that when we have, you know, this great diversity of dogs today is due entirely to selective breeding, which is, by the way, only about 150 years old. You know, there weren't, there were different looking dogs, but not so distinct. So if you ever see, if you've ever been to India, you know, and you see the street dogs there, these kind of medium sized yellow dogs, often yellow, um, or br a little bit brindle, that's the dog that happens if you allow dogs to breed on their own. Was that what the ancestral dogs looked like? No, not necessarily. I mean, there were big dog, mastiff dogs, and there were smaller dogs, and a thousand years ago, there were even lap dogs. Um, so there was already some selection for size and for uh, appearance. But if you do allow full underbreeding, you get these street dogs. Um, not everybody wants a dog that looks like that, but at some level, I think, if I came to know that dog, I would love that dog, right? Uh, maybe it's odd that we choose by looks, and I wonder well, if we should. God wanted the, that dog. <laughs> I, I won't, as a scientist, uh, I will demur. Well, I think it's perfectly clear. I mean, why would it be the, that dog? <laughs> um, Another question. First off, thank you both for this wonderful evening and conversation. Um, it's so fun. And my question is about dog dreams. I'm curious if you've done research or, or could point me to places that people have researched the ways in which dogs dream and what they may be dreaming about. Right, right, the content of the dog's dream. No, that's a great, the great frontier. I don't think anybody has done any research on it, although we certainly, it certainly is the case behaviorally that I think we have perfectly good evidence to say dogs are dreaming, but we don't know what it is about. And the way you would find out is a puzzle, right? So in other words, with when a dog is conscious and behaving, I can look at the context and see what they do in that context and get a sense of what they're experiencing, what they know about what they're doing, what they understand, what they're perceiving. But if they're not conscious, I have no access to that mind. And nor would you if you put EEGs around the head or if you put them in a brain scanner. You know, you might say, oh, well, look, like the amygdala's lit up. And they're like, so they're having some emotional experience, but you wouldn't, still wouldn't get the content. So I'm sorry to say, I don't think in the foreseeable future we will know. So you, <laughs> in other words, the good news is you can just say whatever you want. <laughs> well, they have nightmares. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they do have nightmares, yeah. Alexandra, can you tell us um, what dog has had the most unusual behavior that you've ever that studied? I've ever seen? Yes. <laughs> That's a huge 
a hugely difficult question. Um, no, I don't see behavior as unusual, really. Like, all behavior is just what it is. I don't think I can, right? Like, I mean, I'm looking for a kind of, always I'm looking for average dog behavior. What do dogs, each dog has to stand for all dogs in my studies, right? And so what each dog does tell me something about what all dogs, if they can smell, for instance, a recent study was, um, I asked if dogs could tell the difference between the smell of their owner's shirt and the smell of a stranger's shirt when the sh they're just sniffing them in the box. Um, and uh, we had owners would, who wore t-shirts and like sweated in them for two days. It was really nice of them. <laughs> and then we presented them to the dogs. And so I, and the do what I'm looking for is not the erratic behavior, but what does each dog do? And more or less, it looks like they distinguish between their own, their person's smell and the smell of a stranger. They can tell the difference of that, which we expect, right? But sometimes we're just confirming what we know. So I'm more looking for average behavior, sorry. Oh, last question? I have two questions then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't take direction very well. Um, one very simple question, is there a difference between your lab studies of pets, domesticated dogs, and do you ever get to study wild dogs, or not wild, but you know, the street dogs in India, or I've seen them in other places? Right, I don't study street dogs or, or free-ranging dogs. Um, and this, and the, but if I did, and I do study dogs out in the wild insofar as they're out interacting on their own and I'm not giving them something to look at. Um, and the difference there is that it's entirely observational, right? And, and if, you're, if you're studying the people who do study street dogs in India, you have to chase down the dogs, like with any wild animal, right? Have to find them and locate them, whereas I have the convenience of I know who it is, and they are named by their person, and they come into me that way. So that's the difference. I do like observing an, just natural a animal behavior, you know, and videotaping behavior and, and really slowing down the video to see what's happening on a scale that we don't normally See, there's a lot there, and I don't do that in the lab. And if I can ask a second question, about y your controversial op-ed, which maybe everybody hasn't read yet, but just a very, um, just a clarification question. You were talking about whether dogs should be spayed or neut neutered, and that creates a whole lot of controversy. Are you, I wasn't sure whether you were saying less invasive spading and neuter, neutering, uh, vasectomy would, for males and whatever the equivalent is, would be better. And if it would be better, is it more expensive, more difficult? Why do vets not do that? Right, right. So there, is this, there are a lot of ways to answer that question. So I'm not, I am not really being an advocate in any event, right? I'm bringing out, I'm trying to call attention to the fact that we have stopped paying attention to whether for the most part, we should spay or neuter our pets. And we've kind of offloaded that to society's idea. In fact, it's like a religion that we spay and neuter our pets. It's a mantra that we spay and neuter our pets. And I just want to stop and look again and say, OK, why are we doing it? Probably overpopulation. Did it solve overpopulation? No. Are there other ways to try to solve overpopulation? Yes. You know, what, other, what are the other effects of it? Like, then the dogs don't have the hormones that they need, reproductive hormones have a systemic effect um, in that way. If you're worried about that component, vasectomy or, t or, or t tube tying would be better because you're, gonna, you're not taking out the, the uh, organs which produce the hormones. Um, and these hormones, you know, they're part of memory development, they're part of growth, they're part of bone development. And this is also why you see obese, so many obese dogs, is we're much more, dogs are much more prone to gaining weight if you don't have these hormones coursing. So there are alternatives, is what I was saying. If, and based on what concern, and there are a lot of concerns you have about it, there are a lot of ways we could go societally with it. I think it also is convenient for us, and I'm interested in the fact that we don't want a, a dog, a, we want a sexless dog, right? And we want a dog who isn't messy. But we also say we want what's best for the dog. And so I think those two things collide. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Singard. So um, let's, we're, you'll stick around and sign sure, copies yes, of your of books. And yeah. we, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you for this informative. Thank you.